Good morning, boys and girls, cats and kittens, and butchers and bound puppies. Welcome back to another episode of Strange Recon right here on the Pup Dope. Thank you so much for spending the time with me. It is a rainy, miserable, windy, freaking day for all those that are talking about sunshine. Bring it over this way because it is rough. It's cold. It's windy. It's rainy. It's windy and rainy and windy. All right, anyways. Calling all you history buffs and Cold War tech enthusiasts, buckle up for a show you won't want to miss. Today, we get into the fascinating story of the Dash drone helicopter. This isn't your average remote controlled toy. The Dash was a real life game changing innovation. The first drone helicopter uh, to take flight and fight. And we'll uncover its top secret origins explore its role in underwater warfare and see how it paved the way for modern drone technology so get ready for a step back into the cold war history of technology in espionage as we like to do as of late see uh future guests we have coming on the show i can't wait for that one so get ready for a thrilling ride of the history of aviation basically our archaeology of aviation at this point and uh tune in for the dash story right here after this, stick around. We'll be right back. Get ready. We're talking about the dash. Welcome to Strange Recon. I am here to discuss the so-called flying saucer. You out of your <laughs> mind? It is nothing more than a um, weather observation balloon. Of course, which we, we both knew differently. No, I saw that. I don't give a goddamn what anybody else says about it. I saw that on film. Phil Clasp, he kissed my ass. He wasn't there. I was. When you know all the names in every language of that bird, you know nothing, but absolutely nothing about the bird. You're crazy. You're crazy. You're crazy. I like you. But you're crazy. All right, my friends, welcome, welcome, welcome. Good morning or whatever the hell time it is. Uh, we know this planet is shaped like a race car. I don't know where the sun is. I was in. I was watching that eclipse of the day, and I was like, no way. How could it be dark over there but not dark over here? It makes no sense. The Earth must be shaped like a stock car. I'm sorry I said all that. Let's move on. I am a pseudo-defense beat storyteller here, friends. I aspire to produce informative and engaging content videos that provide valuable insights and analysis on existing YouTube content or other content of the archives of our Defense Information Center. Um, you know, and also reactionary like videos to YouTube content in copyrighted material. My intention is solely focused on critiquing and reviewing the original material in a journalistic manner, offering commentary and fostering meaningful discussion within the online community. It's important to note that my videos are not intended to replace or infringe upon the rights of the original creators or the storytellers or the people that invented these things or involved with the missions, but rather to complement their work and contribute to the broader conversation surrounding it. I am committed to upholding ethical standards and respecting intellectual property while delivering content that entertains and informs my audience and the family here. You know what I'm saying, Recon? Okay. And one more thing. To bring you the best mornings possible or whatever time it is for you your financial support is crucial okay your contributions allow us to invest in better equipment like the microphone and camera system that i have upgraded to it's far better than where we started um it allows us to secure high profile guests and delve deeper into informative stories every bit helps okay you can send your dna in the mail hit the like and subscribe or of course what is, matters most right now uh, is you can donate through Zelly, Cash App, PayPal, Gmail, YouTube, Super Chats, and things like that, and any method that works for you. And uh, once again, thank you for being part of the Strange Recon family over here. Let's get right into it. We're talking about the Dash. Oh, wait, wait. Lord Ludicrous had a good idea. Oh, that's a nice headlock, sir. Oh, ah, uh, yes. I see that you know your judo well. This show is in a headlock, <laughs> and uh, not only are we uh, only growing incrementally, uh, 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 it, I guess that's not even the way I would describe it, but we do need your help sharing the show. So to get us out of this YouTube headlock and all the time I just took off from doing the show, 
I need you to share and all that good stuff. Hit that like and subscribe. If you're one of these viewers that do not, uh, they, they, they do not, so, uh, you know, subscribe to the show. You just watch. That's okay. But do me a massive favor. Help support the show in one way or another uh, by sharing it, liking, whatever. I know a lot of people don't even want to take that risk because I say some words that you might not like or find appropriate. But remember, I'm using them in a context that is humor and not at all serious. Um, okay. Help support the show. Click the links below. That will be my first step in this one. <laughs> I can't enjoy a nice succulent dinner. Okay, anyways, uh, ladies and gents, today we're talking about the dash. As I said, let's bring up some pictures to keep you entertained because apparently if I don't have pictures up, you won't be. So that's fine. Like you you don't think my jokes are funny? You don't think when I read Norm jokes, that's not funny? Well, whatever. I'll just do what YouTube tells me. Here we go. We're bringing up the dash here. Uh, for all those that don't know the dash, it stands for Drone Anti-Submarine Helicopter. Here is a unit patch of the of the dash and uh, sorry for all the clickety clacking you know uh this is a production that's growing so we don't have the ability to have produced content ready to go every morning i'm building it as we talk boom here's the dash cop uh company or the dash actual unit patcher the uh, liaisons to the unit from the gyrodyne company we're gonna go right into it here holy shit how the navy is failing dash that's part of that's the second half we're going to talk the first half about the dash the second half is going to be why the Navy's not using it. Kind of reminds me of uh, Kelly Johnson's old words. Wasn't it Kelly Johnson that first said uh, uh, rule number one of producing military? I can't remember the I'm paraphrasing, but is it's don't make aircraft for the Navy. They don't know what they want. Well, I, there's other companies out there that have said the same thing. I don't know what their deal is, but what was Dash? In the mid-1950s, the Russian submarine force was becoming increasingly ominous in size, numbering over 300. And we're talking about, uh, you know, things like... Um, the Zulu and whiskey class submarines that were, uh, you know, kind of dreaded by um, uh, the Navy at the time because they were in medium range submarines that can move fairly quick and could put out some serious firepower. I am um, trying to bring that up for you now while I talk, but it's not working. Uh, as you know, this show is, I don't want to say it. I'm manifesting by saying things. That's what they tell me. Okay. Here uh, we have a Zulu class and a whiskey class submarine. What the fuck is going on with my computer right now? Okay, here we go. Boom, boom, boom. There is the other one. Uh, and these uh, submarines at the time were, were being produced in the tens. Uh, the two most popular in the late 50s were the Zulu and whiskey class. And they were quite effective and uh, were believed to you know be competitive in a big way to uh, U.S. Navy subs that we're, that we're building. Um, so the dreaded Zulu and whiskey class, large oceanic sub medium multi-purpose submarines in the U S Navy sought a method to counter that threat before any submarine could come within striking distance of a U.S. Navy ship or convoy. Now that's something you should all be familiar with, with just the topics we cover here, the situational awareness to know there's an enemy out there and to take it out or to, to stop it before it can get close to you. That's why the name of the game is to make longer, faster, more sleeker, more agile weapon systems that are more capable and require less human intervention to make them hit their target and terminal phase because we have so much situational awareness around these large vessels to prevent submarines from, uh, from attacking, you know what I mean? And other, other assets. The Navy was developing a rocket launch anti-submarine torpedo called RSOC and the uh, anti-submarine rocket, uh, but this was too limited in range and uh, to take advantage of this increased detection range of the day, that large ANS SQS 26 sonar system, it promised a, a, a much greater, uh, you know, situational awareness than the last stuff. But um, there was no way to deliver these systems because they did not match each other. The rocket could not meet the distance in which the situational awareness was being given. So uh, the RSOC was also very expensive and complex, requiring each ship to be reconfigured by installing a complex control system, adding that these issues were the naval aviators who were not receptive to the idea of launching manned helicopters from small destroyer decks to high sea states. So here we have this awesome new sonar and, of course, evolving radar. Then we have this awesome uh, new torpedo to use against these incoming uh, attacks from submarines. But the idea of launching a helicopter off a high sea state, you know, at levels five, you're talking, I don't even remember the exact numbers anymore as a sailor. I feel embarrassed right now. But uh, 
you know, we're talking upwards of 15 foot waves. Uh, then the, even class six, you're talking maybe like even higher 20 foot waves. That's a big deal to launch a helicopter off the bottom of a boat. And, you you know, it's been done. You see it go where the, they try to time it perfectly. But there's also videos on the Internet of plenty where ship decks meet helicopter landing platforms before the thing could take off or while taking off that essentially drop the helicopter right out of the air. The Navy needed a solution to conduct their small anti-submarine warfare missions, and there was no solution in sight, unfortunately. Until someone had the idea of coming up with something like the Dash. By 1956, the Gyrodyne Company, a small company located in St. James, New York, uh, Long Island, New York, was already working <laughs> with flying uh, coaxial systems uh, they call the Gyrodyne that they picked up after uh, World War II from another company that had gone defunct. And here we have a picture of Papa Papakoas. Oh, what are his names? I got to look it up here. Uh, himself. Oh my God, it's an old picture, folks. They've been designing helicopters for ten years. At that point, they was uh, they they picked up uh, you know coaxial systems with no tail tail engines or tail uh, rotors um, for after World War II. Uh, from a defunct company, and um, they started producing it for 10 years. Their coaxial rotor systems use two rotors opposite pitch mounted on the same mast assembly, which turned in opposite directions. And if you know anything about aviation, you know, I'm losing people, sorry. Damn, man, I cannot keep people's attention. Um, if you know anything about coaxial systems out there, like the Cypher drone I showed you the other day, or other systems, or, or, or even toy helicopters, it removes the need for tail power to stabilize it. Helicopters cause crazy with the amount of torque, they, the crazy amount of vibration, and uh, they they will be destabilized in a matter of moments. The rotor system eliminated the instability associated with torque, and therefore eliminated the need for a power-consuming and mechanical complex tail rotor system. Uh, although the design provided the all the power of the engine, although the sorry the design provided that all the power of the engine be delivered solely for lifting of the vehicle, this occur in addition uh, to reduction of machine size and increased stability. So literally it was uh, less weight and uh, more power to the system. Let's look at one right here. This is obviously a later model, but um, you see this coaxial design, one blade spinning in one direction, the other blade spinning in the other direction. This removes the uh, need for what you see in a lot of helicopters today, although newer helicopters seeing a, the, the tail, the rotor face the other way, it removes the need for, um, for the power there to, to keep the thing stabilized. If you've ever flown in a helicopter, especially like in a combat mission, um, th there's, I mean, it's an unbelievable amount of vibration, noise, and uh, and almost this constant position of the helicopter moving, and uh, not totally, obviously it can get going quite quick, so Korskis can put their nose down and get going, but uh, it's, if you know like, like drifting in a car, it feels kind of like that sometimes. Also, when they get knocked out of the sky, they don't gyrodyne down to the ground like uh, like a lot of uh, coaxial systems do with an auto rotation like setup. Five of Gyrodyne's one man rotocycles, which I just showed a second ago, the two Exron ones and three Exron ones seen uh, a second ago, had been built for U.S. Marine Corps for a flight demonstration back in 1954. Uh, when the U.S. Navy asked Gyrodyne if such a vehicle could be used to provide a cheap method of delivering conventional and nuclear anti-submarine weapons at a range from a surface ship uh, several order at a range from surface ships several orders of magnitude greater than the current systems capable uh, and obviously the answer was hell yeah let's do it from gyrodyne according uh, accordingly in 1958 the navy awarded gyrodyne a contract to make minimum modifications to its model ron one rotocycle um and the ron one rotocycle I'm sorry, but that the, the the picture I showed you in the beginning was actually the, uh, the the system with no body on it, no fuselage. Here's a picture of it with its fuselage on, and uh, you know, rather remarkable looking for the time, in my opinion, because it's um, it just speaks to the uh, the uh, lack of knowledge I have about um, you know uh, non fixed wing aircrafts, you know, rotor rotor blade aircrafts of World War II and beyond. I mean, this thing looks pretty sick, does it not? Imagine wings on this thing. Imagine it, you know. <laughs> It'd be pretty cool. And this uh, this is with uh, larger rotor blades. And of course, it's um, everything's housed inside something. There's an actual fuselage and a door that closes. So the idea is, of course, now let's catch you up here real quick, that um, 
large cruiser ships, a large naval ships are, are are going around. If you ever seen ships travel, they oftentimes travel with like guard guardians, you know, bounders, um, just like an infantry unit would patrol or something in like a staggered column or whatever the hell we're talking about or bounding from from one place to another. We do so purposefully. And just like the Navy went out in the open ocean, they surround their larger assets with boats that can protect them. Boats that have, in those days, depth charges and torpedoes and systems to take out that oncoming threat if they could hear it with sonar. Sometimes they couldn't. So they needed to add that additional layer of defense. You know about things like the E-2 Hawkeye and its long history. Just like the Gyrodyne, it's made to go out there and maybe, you know, run a perimeter constantly looking for... Um, a signal that is being sent to them saying, hey, you're, you are you got to go over here for the submarine. If you go back in history, blimps and things were used. Planes were used. So constant submarine patrols were happening nonstop. And they needed a way to take that option from land, put it on a boat, and then eventually shrink it down so less human error, you know, that the ability for humans to actually do it was possible. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so... Um, I was, was kind of off there a second ago. Um, the feasibility of this system um, was not only to deliver specific specified weapons like nuclear and uh, and anti-submarine torpedoes, uh, but also be able to launch that from a destroyer at any sea state, any sea state. So all the way up to level six, which is and they're not bombies of like Madagascar and South Africa. We're talking thirteen to twenty foot swells. I have sailed in 13-foot seas or beyond. It is not fun. And the only thing that only thing that uh, that I had going for me was that the, the distance between these waves, you know, like a frequency, the distance between the peaks of the waves was, was great enough that my boat was sailing down a whole wave and up the other one. Uh, it, and it wasn't jumping off one and crashing into another where the deck of your boat starts taking off so much, uh, you know, so much water. So this thing needed to be able to launch at any time during the day um and uh in basically any weather um but it was it was simply the any weather state in any sea state that a, a human helicopter pilot um, a human piloted helicopter could not take off and that's all that they really needed at the time and on december 31st 1958 a more formal contract was awarded by gyrodyne uh, by the u.s navy to proceed with the development and construction of nine qh 50 alphas that's a dsn1 and three QH-50Bs, the DSN-2 ASW drone helicopters for the new DASH weapon system concept. So let's jump back real quick to show you what we're talking about here, as I just uh, did a second ago. Now, there are a few different models of this. You know, some were produced, like I just said, very, you know, the beginning of contracts, the beginning of relationships between the military um, or intelligence organizations and companies oftentimes go like you would with any place. Do you go to a restaurant and you have a bad experience and say, I can't wait to come back here? You know, maybe you go somewhere and you're going to try new food. You never tried it, but I've never tried. Maybe you're an English person who's never tried, I don't know, uh, freaking food from an Inuit person. And you're like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to buy out the whole menu. Even if I you know I'm going to eat a bunch of raw seal. No, you're probably going to try one thing and go, okay, it's safe. I'll buy some more. Maybe you don't know about buying something from the internet. Same thing. Just consider what it'd be like to start getting involved with a company and you're going to you know, pick up a huge uh, order eventually, but you want to put your foot in the water. You want to test the product. You want to know that this thing is going to be an asset to you before you invest a total of millions and millions of dollars. I've been, you know, I've been in a room while hearing a contract uh, be discussed and, and hear how just how it is. And it's, you know, it's very, uh, it's like Wall Street almost the way they talk about stuff. Uh, the QH-50A was to be evaluate uh, was to be the evaluation prototype for this airborne uh, portion of the system and capable of carrying one Mach 43 homing torpedo. And on August 12, 1960, the QH-50A made the world's first free flight for an unmanned helicopter at the Naval Air Testing Facility at Patuxent River, Maryland. And uh, you know, there are obviously, if you look through the annals of history here, uh, aviation archaeology, if you will, you will see that there are other attempts of tethered stuff and even crazy, weird microwave lift um, aircraft and ion thrust stuff that was being worked on, all types of stuff. But nothing was prepared to take on these types of roles at that point in time. And for a lot of conspiracy theorists, they'd be like, that's all, that's what you think. 
Well, I think that's what was the truth because they didn't go with it. If they did, then we would have saw it mass produced and we would see vehicles traveling around with no fuel tanks and th stuff like that. But they essentially needed a helicopter that could they could fly without a pilot, and that's what they got. Um, it was powered by one gyrodyne Porsche engine. Uh, on that date, the drone anti-submarine helicopter, the dash concept was realized. Now, that wouldn't be the uh, the lasting engine that ran the thing, but the Porsche engine was the one they went with. And uh, Dash from Concept to Reality went like this. By the time Dash was ready to make its fleet operational appearance in November 1962, the QH-50A design had changed dramatically. And many firsts had occurred. Sorry, drinking coffee. Got some, got some, all right, never mind. Um, with safety pilot on board, uh, the first QH-50 A made the uh, made first ship boarding landing aboard the frigate uh, Mitch Mitcher DL2 on July 1st, 1960. Um, if you're not familiar with that boat, there, I'll give you a picture of it right here. Everyone says that I need to show more pictures. Now, again, I'm just trying to. <laughs> this is what a picture is, and this is what a crayon tastes like, Recon. I'm just kidding. Obviously, you know, there's a reason why people want to see what I'm talking about. Who the hell wants to just hear it? Okay, so they figured out a way to fly one around with a person dangling from it. Uh, you've seen drones in the past uh, from Ryan Aeronautical, uh, like the Ghost Bat, I believe it was. It had a big gap uh, where uh, telecommunication stuff was put, and they actually had a pilot hit, sitting there because, technically speaking, at the day uh, of the day, there's there's been you know laws put in place and regulations, and before those special certificates of exception or laws are changed through the FAA or whatever controlling commissions there were, there needed to be a pilot on board. You've seen that with electric driverless cars today or hybrid driverless cars today, where in certain states or, or regions of that state, you're allowed to use the driverless car option as long as you keep one finger on the wheel. Now, that's not the case, I think, anymore for some stuff, but they might even be, I don't even know, I haven't kept up with it, but they literally said you could drive as long as you had one, as long as you're touching the wheel in one way. Even if the wheel's spinning and you have just one finger touching it, you're allowed to use the driverless option to quickly correct. I don't know if that's still a thing, but that was for a little while and everyone was kind of laughing at that. Hey, everyone in the chat. Thank you for being here. Sorry, I didn't stop. Thank you. Good morning, Renee, Gracie, Simon, Lord Ludacris. Thank you for being here. Okay, okay, okay. This time it landed on the frigate without a safety pilot. And it was the first one to land on a helicopter. Uh, first helicopter landing aboard. Uh, I'm sorry, this. Uh, then they trusted one without a, a safety pilot on board to grab the controls if need be. And it landed on the USS da Hazelwood DD-531 while at sea on December of 1960. Uh, 1960. In subsequent operation evaluations of uh, uh, off Key West, Florida, 38 flights were made from the Hazelwood and 22 simulated ASF ASW missions, confirming the feasibility of the Dash weapon system. The Hazelwood would later be converted as the trial ship for the Dash development. I mean, as you know, what we've discussed many times, it's not just the weapon. I mean, sure, that's great. You might be able to produce the best slingshot ever made. But if the Navy wants it to be a, you know, a feasible system they can reuse all the time, it's going to occupy real estate on that ship. It's going to have to have infrastructure for its upkeep, uh, for, uh, you know, uh, obviously for returning, being uh, torpedoes being added to it. It needs to be able to launch. It needs its own platforms. I'm sure that there were problems in the mind of the pilots that were flying regular hel helicopters like, <laughs> I don't trust this fucking thing. Anyways, uh, I should have swore. Damn it. Eventually, the QH-50A design was changed to incorporate a heavy fuel turbine engine, the T-50B08, made by Boeing aircraft that would increase reliability. The designs and all these things are being negotiated at the same time. So you got to remember like a lot of things that don't make it into the hands of the operator or the service member because it's not just the company that produced the product. That When the Navy steps in or the CIA steps in or someone steps in that's also involved in this contract, you have, you know, you know, different engine, an electric engine, different signature reduction, different weapon systems. Who's going to be controlling the electronics on this thing? Yeah, the, the Gyrodyne company wasn't making an anti-submarine drone. They were being asked to make one. So obviously, they did not have the infrastructure to produce all of these products the Navy needed. Other companies needed to be hired to, to fill in that position. And a lot of those companies, of course, were hired through nepotism. And of course, they had the infrastructure already to do it. So 
The design was then also changed to allow the twin torpedo carrying capability, which is seen in this picture here. If you've ever been to the Intrepid in New York City, uh, my great uncle served on that boat. And uh, according to uh, him, and he served on another boat and he was uh, in the water in the Pacific multiple times due to uh, being torpedoed and attacked from enemy aircraft. Um, Miss your Ray, you old racist bastard. Let's bring this up here. Every time I ask my uncle about uh, about what his time in war was like, it's always hilarious. It sounds like a freaking prison system. Even though World War II, you know this 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 alleged you know uh, you know these the, the greatest generation. I'm not saying it wasn't, but it's funny. Uh, who gets the call? I I've, I've I've changed that. The greatest generation was from 1730 to 1770. Why? I don't know. White gloves and wigs. No. Uh, here's the dual torpedo system. You can see this on the Intrepid today. If you go to New York, it's right there for everyone to see. I used to see the Intrepid out my window at work when I was making a bad uh, television for the uh, for reality TV, yeah, or unscripted as we called it. And uh, I used to think about it all the time, just how, what it would be like to serve on that thing and uh, be out in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by Allied vessels, but suddenly seeing the sky go dark with Japanese zeros and stuff. It would be absolutely nuts. And all those times where they had information on the... Uh, on the Japanese Navy and and just, you know, I don't know. There's just a lot of stuff. I, I don't even know the true story of the Intrepid. I've never really looked into it. Maybe I should do a whole episode on it in honor of Ray. But there's the dual, dual torpedo system right there. Here we go. Okay. Um, the first production model being January 25th, nice day, although the model aircraft would be deployed first to the destroyer USS Buck DD 761 on January 7th, 1963. Overall deployment to the US fleet was delayed by one year due to vib vib vibration problems, <laughs> libation, that's nothing else, uh, with the initial batch of 80 aircraft leading to the grounding on June 5th, 1963. The vibration under full load severely affected the altitude sensing device the uh, barometric flight control, resulting in loss of several aircraft. And you can see a picture of it uh, right here, of them recovering one off the side of the ship, which was a common occurrence. Okay, I guess I don't have that picture available. What the fudge? Um, okay, I had a picture of it, but I guess I don't have it anymore. Sorry. So once uh, the um, a fix had been made that allowed this thing to handle the load of nuclear possible nuclear torpedoes of this dual torpedo system of the day, the DAS received its approval of large scale production after President John F. Kennedy watched the, a DASH demonstration from a ship board from shipboard during a naval firepower demonstration off the West Coast during the, the month of June of 1963. The helicopter took off in a moderate seas from its par uh, parent destroyer and delivered a torpedo close enough for the presidential party to see. Later in 1963, 1963 Secretary of Defense Robert uh, McNamara, bang, flash, smash, boom. Okay, you know what I'm talking about. Approved budgeting uh, enough aircraft to provide two plus one backup aircraft for each of the Navy's 240 Fram 1 and 2 destroyers. In addition, the development models uh, were then deployed um, by themselves. So essentially, the uh, this thing had a. They did a show of force in front of the president, and it was so badass that the president was like, "We need these on every ship." Also, hook is. Here's some numbers for you while we're talking about it. Hey, Dorothy, glad to see you here. Good morning. Hope the weather is nicer than it is here up there in the northern states. Here we go. Aircraft so far, of course, you saw that you heard the test of the DS-1, of the QH-50A, and then, of course, the B, the, the total of 12, uh, 12 aircraft were in testing and design before uh, the president saw them and recognized, uh, wow, this is clearly, um, you know, a valuable system and is needed. Now, if you read enough information uh, from the Defense uh, Central, I'm sorry, the Defense Information Center there, um, about the Cold War technology, you will see that there's plenty of people out there that honestly don't even believe drones should exist today. 
not because they think they're dangerous or stupid, but they believe that the total novel nature of them is just that there's no pilot. And that's why we think they're so cool. The, the effect of, uh, or the wonder of, uh, of like a, a, a Tesla-like experience in Madison uh, Square Garden, uh, you know, or the Rockefeller Center, wherever the hell he was up in New York when he did that test of the wireless boat uh, in the early 1900s. It, you know, that, that novelty has never worn off. Um, they would say, well, like, what's the what's the value in investing all our money in a pilotless vehicle if we can just invest our money in new weapons that do the same thing? And and that is where a lot of like the race exists today in the U.S. military. You have uh, in the intelligence organization as well, and just the you know military uh, complex out there. You have two routes. You have and they join together on multiple occasions, of course. But you have the delivery system and the actual weapon system. And the novelty of drones has never worn off. They're bigger than ever. The proliferation of drones has gone crazy. It is the new internet. It is the mobile phone. It is an industry that you don't see it yet because it's it's not in front of your face. If, if I could tell you anything, and I'm no genius, but it would be to invest in something to do with drones. Maybe not the tech or the hardware, because that will probably change quite often. But in the organizations, if they're a publicly traded company that are producing software that controls drones or offers better stabilized flight or whatever it may be because no one really saw the internet coming coming except futurists that were you know also working in stock market no one saw the internet of things even after the internet no one knew the mobile phone would be what it is today like do, do you get what i'm saying like no one would have picked up a, a telephone even when they first came out mobile phones and they're like oh, this looks just like fucking a mash you know walkie talkie for Christ's sakes. Um, no one would have thought back then that the mobile phone would be how you paid your bills, how you checked in on your kids at home with a babysitter, how you saw through your front door, how you watched porn, how you whatever the hell it is, you know. Sorry for that. I've just got this episode demonetized. You know, the <laughs> the the uh the the phone never was, you know, today people still call it a phone, and obviously is it really a phone? But the same thing with drones. So when drones take over the world, not literally, maybe, I don't know, I'm, I'm not a Matrix fan, really. But when drones eventually take their true position in our society, they will be nothing like what we're thinking today. Today, they're uh, uh, military assets and a novelty of, of, of an enthusiast, aviation enthusiast. And, uh, you know, we see they're kind of being implemented in some uh, uh, regions of, of um you know, for looking at infrastructure, uh, of course, uh, farming, all types of stuff. But you don't truly see what they're good for because it's not the drone. It's the drone's job. It's the software that runs it. When I showed you that video of Pandolfi's company and his daughter, Princess Layla, whatever her name is, uh, um, following poachers and, 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 and obviously spying on the Chinese, in my opinion, um, no one would expect that a drone would be autonomously left on its own to go follow snow leopards around. The snow leopard has no idea it's up there. And it just sits in, in a distance and watches the snow leopard and waits for poachers, waits for, uh, you know, uh, watches the snow leopard, uh, you know, do its job as a predator. No one expected that. No one expected a drone to be saving people as a lifeguard or monitoring the, inf the infrastructure of bridges and th things like that. No, it's just it's so invest in the future of drones because they are going to take over the world in, in every aspect of every industry. You will see them. And, and so back then, when the president saw that. In obviously a president that had experience on the on a naval ship, um, when he saw the ability to remove the pilot and the danger of doing something that we've been doing for so long with pilots, with blimps and airplanes and everything else and helicopters, it was obviously going to take over. And uh, this was um, this was a big deal in a new time, especially in 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 been working with drones for a long time at this point, but especially with helicopters. So um, you know, right back into it here. The Dash operated from destroyers um, and, and was a major asset for a long time. Let's look real quick at a few other pictures here. So uh, it's not just me rambling. Oh, there was a picture of them recovering it off the side of the boat because they crashed um, quite a bit. My bad. I screwed up there. There's quite a few uh, incidents where these things would vibrate off their rocker and fall into the ocean. But, you know, no one felt bad. Gyrodyne would be able to replace this and get paid for it. The Navy wouldn't lose an operator, uh, a pilot. The uh, And uh, quite frankly, um, you know, it's reassuring. It did what it had to do. Um, it, it, it spared the life of a pilot, you know. 
Sorry. Anyways, for anti-submarine warfare missions, uh, known as ASW, the dash was going to be quite an effective tool. Why aren't these opening up, you son of a bee? Wow. Sorry, guys, one second here. Sorry, this is taking forever. What is happening? Okay. As I said, for anti-submarine warfare mission ASW, the QH-50C initially moved from its heated hangar to the small flight deck aft of the hangar. There it would be uh, would receive either its either a uh, there it would receive either a single or twin installation of the MK-44 homing torpedoes I showed you a minute ago. Then the QH-50 Chuck was tied down with uh, quick release connection cables that was operated by the drone controller. Two uh, umbilical cables were also connected to the aircraft, one for engine start power and the other to power up the gyroscopes of the automatic flight control system. The 300 SHP Boeing 50 T50BO a turbine engine needed a little warm up and allowed for takeoffs within two minutes of engine start, which is pretty good. I mean, we're talking, uh, you know, pretty advanced stuff here. And this is well before, I mean, the electronic equipment, of course, was 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 there and coming. They, they controlled it with multiple electronic systems and trips and, and, uh, and um, alerts. And of course, this is well past the point of of, uh, of very useful electronics and aircraft. So they were adding them to them. But for something that was so small and easy to use, it was rather remarkable. Hey, Gracie, thanks for being here. I appreciate your time. I'm boring everyone today. See, I'm Gracie. I drove her away. The takeoff and landing controller had a station at the deck level on one side of the ship at the hangar. He was able to control the collective pitch by setting the altitude wheel on the left of the deck control the heading was controlled by a large knob left of the indicator display. And to uh, if you want to see what that looked like, um, <laughs> take a look at this here. There's, um, now I don't know who was even saying it recently, but uh, they, they were talking about um, UFOs compared to drones and stuff and how the drones couldn't be um, an answer for anything because of how many people were involved with flying these things. But I, I say nay. Um, the, the, uh, you know, the, they reduced the number of uh, personnel on board, contractors on board and Navy personnel took over rather quickly. And they do so with all things. Um, when you, de when you deploy with an, uh, with a system that requires a ton of intervention from the company that's producing it, um, you know, there starts to be this fine line of contractors deployed with you and they start to try to reduce that and have this, the service members take over. They can't always do that. And so the dash always technically had to have people, um with it something i remember who, who was that guy pj hughes the nimitz encounter guy who i made a statement one time and he like like tried to say i was a liar and had no idea what i was talking about how i said that at any given time um there can be you know um a sh like a shit ton of contractors on a naval ship um to support the systems on board because the navy and just like every other military does not create uh and and uh you know it's they don't keep up the systems themselves solely. A lot of these systems are proprietary software that uh, and, and hardware that they don't know how to even run. They know how to keep it up. The gate just fell over out there. It blocks the dog. Sorry. Um, and, uh, you know, the, there's, uh, there's kind of a lot to take on when it comes to explaining how uh, contractors work al along the military to produce these things. But, um, you know, one of, one thing is for sure is that um, the, 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 I think the best way to look at it is PhD to master level education. Um, if you're in a physics course and you're using tools that are specifically designed to produce a, 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 a graph or, uh, you know, something that, you know, whatever this thing produces, the printer shoots out the test and you look at it and it's a bunch of squiggly lines. Well, the master's degree person and the PhD in this uh, thing can read that graph. You won't be able to read it. You've never looked at this graph before. You don't even know how to read these types of graphs. 
but the PhD knows how to read it. The master degree student knows how to read, has, knows, knows how to read it. But if the machine that, that is doing the testing breaks, only one person in that room, if they have the PhD and they work on that system, know how to do it. It's the PhD student or, or PhD uh, uh, you know, holding person. The difference between the, the military and the system integrators, the software engineers, the hardware engineers uh, of these um, of these systems, you know, they have a, they have a, you know a skill set that is that can't be passed down to a soldier. They just can't, or a service member. They they can't. It's impossible. That's like asking way too much. Can you imagine asking someone whose job it is to hit the button and target uh, you know enemy aircraft or something? is also asked to now become a software engineer with 15 to 20 years experience. It's not happening. So when, you know, PJ Hughes thinks that he he's telling everyone on the internet, like he knows everything about how this system works and it couldn't be this, it couldn't be this. It's like, dude, there are things that you'll never know because they're not your job to know. And they're never, no one's job to know except the contractors who work for the company, like these folks you see here. Anyways, moving on. The takeoff and landing controller had a station at the deck level and on one side of the ship at the hangar. He was able to control the collective pitch by setting the altitude wheel on the left of the control hangar, uh, on the left of the deck control. He headed to the was controlled by the large, uh, it was a large knob left of the indicator display. The, cyc uh, the cyclical stick, I can't be right, controlled by the direction of pitch and roll of the aircraft. So there was a, a, a large knob on the left with an indicator display, and that helped tell the operator how to use the stick to control the pitch and roll of the aircraft. Um, on takeoffs and sea states ranging from calm to number six, the 14 to or 13 to 20 foot, uh, the controller applied full power and set a high altitude, which applied up collective pitch on the rotors. Then he released the hold down cable and uh, the aircraft climbed, so they, they released those quick, quick uh, release cables, and the aircraft just instantly started climbing, as it obviously should. At the predetermined altitude set on the control station, the aircraft leveled off and was guided on the pre-selected heading towards its target by the deck controller. I mean, that's pretty advanced for time. That sounds like a regular DJI today in, to some degree. Um, uh, obviously, it's shrunken down and made a lot easier. But uh, as you see just right here, this itself takes up room on the deck of the ship. You know, these are the learning lessons. And the, the reason why I get into Cold War technology is because, and even earlier, is because when you look at the technology today and you see that, uh, you know, that a, a drone essentially can fold up and go into a little box and that box is stored under the deck somewhere uh, and it comes up automatically like some sort of like, you know, auto lift TV in someone's house. Jerry Seinfeld, why do you got to hide your TV? Why don't you want anyone to know you have a TV? Um, you know, that, that, it, there, that this is a, a, a story where it goes from lots of hardware, pretty clunky, lots of uh, employees involved to automation. You know, um, reducing the number of things that can break through, through, you know, testing, engineering, make it simple, make it work, make it repeatable. And so just like large weapon systems we covered in the past, like the uh, you know, uh, you know, the the re-entry, I mean, the uh, ICBMs or not even ICBMs, but uh, you know, things like the Rattler system, uh, things like uh, that were 40 feet long. It could launch their own missiles, end up becoming five feet long and under the wing of an F-18. And so you see that it's about shrinking the product and making it more effective or finding a clever way to deliver that product in a way that takes up less space. This is too much space. These people are exposed. Do you see any type of protective shield? Remember, a Navy ship is meant to be at war uh, or is meant to, to, to fight. So could you imagine having a bunch of guys in ties, different types of organizations there, you know what I'm saying? I would expose on the deck like this to have to control a freaking drone. It's, a, it, you know, it's revolutionary, but not ideal. And these lessons obviously would be learned, as you see today where an entire drone ship is out there with a deck covered in drones that fly autonomously. On takeoff and sea states ranging from calm to number six, the controller applied the power, blah, 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 blah. You see right here. And uh, that's when CIC would take over. The information center in the boat, um, the combat information center in the boat uh, would take over the system and, um, and essentially operate from there after a predetermined course and patrol route in which this thing would fly. 
In the meantime, another controller in the combat information center has observed the helicopter on the radar scope indicator at a station. He's not, or she's not looking with their eyes. They're, I mean, you know, they're not looking at some sort of visual camera system. They're looking at the radar. He set his dials to conform with the flight speed headed, heading and altitude of, of the flying QH-50C on signal control passed down uh, from the deck officer to the CIC. And uh, that was through this little special box right here. It was extremely proprietary at the time and uh, would eventually, of course, be replaced by other systems that just on board. But here you go. Here's the control transmitter, just for your own information. That's what it looked like, early control transmitter uh, from inside the control uh, command combat information center, rather. The CIC controller operated from a dual purpose scope that followed the drone by the MK-25 fire control radar system and indicated that this target submarine location as determined by the SQS-23 sonar detection system. So these are multiple systems working together to accomplish one goal, to not only locate the submarine that is approaching or uh, stalking this, this fleet or this whatever they call these guys out there now, um, and the control system that would direct the helicopter and understand uh, exactly how, where and how it's going to launch this system, uh, launch the, uh, the, the torpedoes. He was able to track the drone using the SPS-10 tracking radar, using three integrated sources of information. My bad, I, I said two, but I meant three there. The, com uh, the combat information center controller was able to maneuver the drone towards the target. When the sonar and radar indicated the drone position coincided and the target had been identified as an enemy submarine, the CIC controller actuated the arming and release switches, dropping the MK-44 homing torpedoes. These uh, homing torpedoes, um, you know, it, it must have been fun to fire them, but let's all be real with each other right now. Uh, there's something inside of me, and I'm not even there. I'm just reading it and thinking about it. There's something inside of me that would be, I'd be nervous. I'd be, you know, a little concerned that the targets we've identified are not commuting back with us, communicating back with us uh, for another reason. And I may be firing upon something that isn't exactly a confirmed ad adversarial target. Um, and that is uh, something that we, you know, that the military um, has been dealing with for a long time. And, uh, and obviously we've had awful, awful cases of fratricide and stuff like that, but, um, you know, but, uh, it is still, it is still revolutionary. And, um, these homing torpedoes, um, were uh, attached obviously one at a time. Uh, the first, uh, QH 50 alphas and bravos were tested with one. Then they had the, th the two on the uh, Chuck and they're preparing it for uh, future assets on board later on. Look at that friggin' thing! It looks like something out of a out of a out of one of those uh, post-apocalyptic steampunk shows or something. I don't know what I'm saying. Looks like my first sampler. Okay, at this point, the deck controller took over and landed the aircraft. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me just go back here. I messed up there. The uh, MK-44 homing torpedoes, as I just showed you, is right here underneath or the Mark 17 nuclear depth charge with the 44 warhead. Most people, when they hear about these things, they don't realize their original purpose was to drop nuclear weapons. And of course, just saying that, you you know, thoughts of like, you know, Hir Hiroshima or something show up in your head or, 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 or thoughts of, uh, you know, like an atomic testing with some vast things blows up. But you got to remember the, um, just like freaking Putin today, um, we can drop small nuclear weapons. Come on, we drop the way, the way, the way. We drop small ones. Control nuclear, S small, not the big. No, no, small. It's like, well, you know, these are enough to do the job. Um, nuclear weapons being dropped from a drone in uh, the early '60s is pretty shocking for a lot of people in UFO town. Drones don't even exist, so it's it's even crazier to confront this type of. Uh, idea with, uh, you know, if, if and I'm trying to provide at least enough information and context that people, you know, actually get some curiosity and insp inspiration instead of just denying that these things exist. They did. And they, they had a crucial role, a drone with the responsibility of holding and deploying a nuclear weapon in the early sixties is one bad mother of cold war technology. I mean, consider that 
Today, we talk about giving the drone the right to autonomously acquire a target and kill it. A lot of companies have like this, you know, fail safe, red light, green light option that they're allowed their operators to push just in case they change their mind or whatever. And that's great. They're working on that as well here. But the uh, this is early days, folks. This is the early 60s in a drone that deployed nuclear weapons. That is wild stuff. Wild, weird, wild stuff. After weapons release, the drone was flown back to the uh, vicinity of the ship. At this point, the deck controller took over and landed the aircraft on the flight deck by decreasing altitude until the aircraft's uh, skids made contact with the deck. A switch on the skids set the collective to only six degrees of incident upon landing. Oh, so the skids themselves had a... Oh, I see. That's actually pretty smart. So instead of having to worry for the operator, because I'm sure the first ones were like someone was watching it and we got ready to push a button, these things automatically... Okay. Um, although the land... Um, <clears throat> avoiding most uh, bouncing, uh, possible bouncing, uh, although landing can occur this way up to sea state number three, a method to achieve landing using a system called LAD or SLAD um, was attempted for sea states in number six, but met with limited results. Um, and that's what we're talking about here when we say the systems that uh, that helped it from, from smashing into the deck when the, 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 the deck of the boat is going up and down at extreme degrees. I mean, consider, we you know, we don't even... We forget that uh, that it's not just always on a glass surface. You know, the Navy is not just out there um, <laughs> traveling around on um, on glass seas. You know, they got to cross oceans and fight the fight when uh, the seas are rough and no one else wants to be there. You know, the infantry likes to find swamps, rivers, and dense jungles where they don't think the enemy is hiding or not, will never go themselves. And the Navy, of course, has to go into sea states that are, are absolutely horrifying to the to the public. But you see right here at the bottom of it, this thing would be compressed, right? And the the uh, the aircraft would try to automatically correct to uh, you know to specific uh, you know angle, which obviously was not they say is not wasn't totally uh, successful, but it did pave the way for to know how to do it. What's up, Bobby Broadway? Dope knows. Good morning. Glad to see you. Hope you guys are well. Glad you're here. We missed your faces. All right. <clears throat> so upon landing, the engine would shut down with the rotor stopped and secured at rotor RPMs of 400 or 400 uh, RPMs or less. Special gust locks activated to prevent the blades from contacting each other. Uh, and heavy seas. There's a lot of bounce there. You got to remember that. And these things are close together. Um, uh, the aircraft was winched back into the hangar and tied down. In calm seas, simple ground handling wheels made uh, moving the a drone easy. Obviously, it was extremely light. After tie down, the logbook entry was made and the drone was re readied for its next mission, um, <clears throat> which was uh, within 24 hours. I believe they said that e they could put it back out there very shortly in just a few hours, but they tried to do some preventative maintenance on it and uh, any type of repairs to see anything they could. So they, they had two and they only really needed one at a time. Each ship was ro rocking two there. Um, the Navy's dash management, um, the airborne portion of dash was handled by the Navy, of course. In 1961, in 1961, one year after the dash program uh, first got underway, the Giardine, the Giardine company started a crew training program to teach drone controllers how to fly the aircraft system integrators i once held a system integrator job thinking it would be good for me anyways at that time <clears throat> gyrodyne's responsibility was strictly limited to airborne portion of the dash weapon system by july 1963 the navy had assumed this role at two fleet introduction sites fis you know people really need to stop talking shit about the lgbtq queef whatever uh um acronym because the military is unbelievably ridiculous with this horseshit with the acronyms and initialisms. I never saw it while I was in, but god damn, am I tired of reading acronyms when I'm out? Oh, grab the Fizz 402 Qui Alpha. What's that? It's the Quibit. Okay, anyway, the, 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 the FIS CC, the FIS C, oh my god, FIS SCI, which is the Fleet Introduction Site San Clemente Island, off the California coast and another at Dam Neck. Um, more drone action off San Clemente. I wonder if it was confused or anything. 
Uh, off the island of California coast and another at Dam Neck, Virginia, responsible for running these training schools uh, were Utility Squadron 3, VU3. TSVU3. Oh, my God. And on the West Coast, Utility Squadron 6, VU6. What? On the East Coast. Yeah, whatever. I'm moving my past here. I'm starting to stutter too much. Overall program control for the Navy was by the Anti-Submarine Warfare Division, uh, headed by Rear Admiral J.N. Schaefer, who reported the, to the Deputy Chief of Naval Operations. Program management located in the Bureau of Naval Weapons under Rear Admiral Alan M. Shin. When the program officer, uh, with the program officer being uh, Commander J.C. Henderson in the Directorate for Undersea Warfare Programs, pictured right there on the left. Left to right is Rear Admiral William H. Groverman. William H. Groverman, Director of Anti-Submarine Research, and Gyrodyne's President, Peter J. Pap Papadakis, which is, uh, he's been at it for quite some time. Now, this guy, again, started right after World War II and picked up a lot of equipment from another company. I, I already forget the name of it. Um, Damn, I had their information up earlier, but I forget. I hate not to say Bendix, Bendix Helicopter Company, which most people, again, don't even realize helicopters were flying in World War II. Um, <clears throat> and, of course, the public was completely unfamiliar with helicopters, especially other countries that never had seen anything like that, just had fixed-wing aircraft at best. Um, so they were uh, they were quite a sight to see. Helicopters were all the rage and were offering, uh, a, a new, you know, VTOL. And VTOL was what a lot of people wanted. Anyways, uh, so, and then uh, on the right there is Rear Admiral J.N. Schaefer visiting Gyrodyne's QH-50 Chuck Dash Manufacturing Facility on May 23, 1962. The ship portion of Dash, originally, um, Dash was a standoff ASW um, weapon program designed to operate from U.S. naval destroyers, but, in but by 1960, the Sumner gearing in Fletcher class destroyers, as well as a destroyer tenders of various classes, were aging and in need of major and in need of major overhaul and reconstruction. And to accommodate the new weapon system, they didn't have anything even available. Again, real estate on a ship at that time and even today would lead to decision making that would change things forever. If there's an awesome weapon that's designed, and they're like, let's test it out. And they're shooting it over in white sands. And then they go and fucking look at the financial agreement with a company and say, and then look at the ship and go, well, it's going to cost us a billion dollars just to put a freaking spot on this ship to launch the damn thing. They're not going to buy it. And it will sit on a shelf somewhere. Probably, you know, not allowed to be sold to other countries and things like that. You know, contracting with the military for new products is not easy. <clears throat> After careful analysis of the situation, the Secretary of the Navy ordered the beginning of the fleet re rehabilitation and modernization of the FRAM program. This amounted to a complete refurbishment of the ship's hull machinery in addition of new superstructures. They need to strengthen these bad layers up. A lot of lessons to learn with that kinetic energy of World War II guns. The FRAM program consisted, in Korean one there, the FRAM program consisted of two levels of modernization the more extensive FRAM-1 reconstruction, and somewhat less extensive the FRAM-2 modernization. The FRAM-1 program involved installation of both the RSOC and DASH systems. You see? The, the, they needed to reconstruct the ship to revolve around this. But what happens when the technology advances just as fa faster than <clears throat> slow-ass military reconstruction or renegotiation of contracts or re actual rebuilding of stuff? <clears throat> I have a guy that uh, made submarines for the Navy I was trying to get him on the show. He's kind of nervous to talk about it because he didn't have, uh, you know, the greatest experience at the end of his career. But, uh, he, you know, he, he's and of course, he's never going to share with me anything uh, confidential or on the show. But, it, it you know, it, it's it's crazy to hear just how long some of these things take. It reminds me of when you're in New York City and you hire someone to fix a door in your apartment. And they're like, well, the landlord said technically I can do this job for five days. So I'll see you for the next five days. You're like, dude, fix the door. Meanwhile, every 20 minutes, like, can I get some water and use your bathroom? It takes forever to accomplish things in the military. There's a lot of red tape and a lot of uh, renegotiations and horseshit going on. In the Fram 1 reconstruction, one of the twin 5-inch gun mounts was removed as weight compensation for the RSOC system. 
You see, they had to exchange. There's like, you know, everything is measured and weighed and put on the boat and displacement is looked at and says, well, it's still buoyant, but now it's like 10 feet lower than it was before. Not literally 10 feet, but everything is accounted for. But the Frams 2 modernization kept all three of their five inch gun mounts. Unless the destroyer was equipped with a variable depth sonar VDS in which a mount was lost for weight compensation. The dash weapon system consisted of the installation of a flight deck, a, pl a platform for the dash helicopter land by itself. It did not share, unless, of course, it had to, a platform with regular helicopters uh, that were already on the ship because it needed to be hooked up. It needed to place the touchdown. It needed to be able to fall off the side and possibly into a net. The dash weapon system consisted of the installation of a flight deck. Um, hangar facility. Deck control station. CIC control station. That's the command information center inside the ship. Needed to have a new desk at it with a, a computer system in front of them. Early computers. In. And the SR4 transmitter facility. And four and, four and a half antenna installation stations. So seven upgrades need to be brought to a ship for this one drone to work. There's something that's really hard um, th about people to understand that when it comes to when they say things like, you know, the military, you know, if they had this badass stuff, they'd use it or they don't have anything that's badass because then they'd be using it, blah, blah, blah. There are so many factors that go into place. I say it a million times. Do you think? the Beretta was the best weapon system on the planet when the army was like, we're going to replace, you know, all these maintenance clean guns that were proven to be great for all these years. It wasn't. They just, it was a contract driven by nepotism and obviously economical motivations. And so you don't get the best product. You get something that's reliable. The military is not driving around in armored Lamborghinis. The military is driving around in armored Honda Civics, if you will, not literally. That's a metaphor, uh, metaphorically speaking. I don't know what metaphor means. I just like to use it a lot. The following U.S. Navy shipyards were engaged in the FRAM program. West Coast, the FRAM facility is located at Long Beach, California, San Francisco, Hunter Point, Mare Island, California, Puget Sound, Bremerton, beautiful place. I love it. I miss it. And Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. The East Coast Fram facilities were located in Boston, Massachusetts. I didn't know that. I should look into that one. New York City, New York, Norfolk Naval uh, Shipyard in Virginia, and uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Charlestown, South Carolina. Yikes, these pictures are rough, but they're the originals. Um, <clears throat> Ready on the USS Lynn DD-703 at Norfolk. The Gyrodyne contractual commitment to DASH system not only to keep the aircraft flying and to solve command and control problems on the ship, but to anticipate future problems was a massive responsibility, placing Gyrodyne employees around the world to assist the Navy with a new weapon system. By 1964, Gyrodyne technical representatives, tech reps, were stationed at the following facilities. Now, this is what the argument between me and PJ Hughes was when he was telling us all that none of us knew what the hell we were talking about because we can't simply read the internet or have experience in the military or for contractors with contractors. Uh, my entire military career was working in tandem with General Dynamics and Augustine. They, I, I, every single day I went to work, except for the first, you know, year and a half of my army career, a year and a month of my army career, in which I didn't have a long career, but uh, was, you know, I was went to one one five third ID first at Benning, and uh, you know that that was, uh, uh, I thank God I got out of there. No offense to one one five third ID, but it was. It reminded me of like a unit that didn't want to be a unit and everyone just, I was rough. But when I got to the uh, West Coast, a new unit was being started up. The 4th Battalion, 9th Infantry. Uh, the 9th Infantry Regiment was being refired up for the first time since like Vietnam. Well, no, that's not true. The 9th Infantry would have been around, but our specific unit was not around. And, and due, due to the surge from George Bush, <clears throat> you know, there was uh, a lot of um, a lot of action happening with the, uh, recommissioning of old units and my unit was one of them and after about a year of the most wild west like shit no ncos we had one guy who had two years experience in the military was the leader of like a shitload of kids i mean i'm not kidding i was 18 years old and we had one guy he was my end up being my squad leader i just talked to him the other day actually i mean he was in charge of and this was like january of 
Yeah, it, um, it was early in the year, and I just remember there was no NCOs. And then I met our first sergeant at, who was never around, and I'm just like, oh, my God, this is going to be insane. And over the next year or two, uh, we would end up meeting a company that worked with us nonstop. Every single day we worked with these people, and I specifically worked with them every single day, uh, being in the command group. And then I got moved back to the line platoon, which I wanted to be in. And uh, and and I thought, well, I guess I won't be seeing these guys anymore. But then I just started wearing the land warrior system. So I went from being like in the room with these guys as they facilitated every need land warrior needed to then suddenly wearing the system and, and you know, being a part of this test. And uh, I wouldn't change a damn thing. I mean, I wish the system worked better. But like most systems that are clunky and rather new to the actual field, you know, operating them. Just like the, the dash system, not everything works very great right away, even if it's the idea of it. And you can see, obviously, this is wh where we're going. Uh, but it wasn't uh, ultimately it didn't, uh, you know, operate the exact way the first try. Anyways, OK, anyways, let's move on here. Sorry, I'm rambling. <clears throat> so this is uh, this is um, what I was trying to tell PJ Hughes about um, how like all the systems on a Navy ship today are completely dependent on on contractors and not the military because if they if something breaks the con the military's like i mean i'll restart it like i was told to i'll unplug it and plug it back in i'll take the cartridge out of the nintendo and blow in it and put it back in and push it real hard on the thing but it's still not okay it's working again great they need the contractors because they're the ones that created it designed it they were there from its from they, when they saw it come to life anyways these contractors are stationed everywhere from U u.s naval base and uh, Yokosaka, Japan, Kubi Point, Philippines, Cubby, Kubi, I don't know, Honolulu, Naples, Italy, Newport, Patuxent River, Maryland, um, New Fork, Charlestown, Jacksonville, Mayport, Panama City, Key West, Bremerton, Washington, San Francisco, Long Beach, San Clemente Island, North Island, California, and two different bases and uh, two different positions in San Diego. I mean, they were everywhere. That's why when you think of stories like the Nimitz encounter and stuff like that, and and just uh just how much you know how many times they're trying to limit you know what you know what people think about it, you got to understand the systems don't work smoothly, and the reason why there's so many contractors out there is because they need to be there for when things break, when they don't operate properly. And what did you hear a lot about the Nimitz encounter? How things weren't working the way they should because these things were showing up on screen and stuff, and we had no recollection of them. I mean, we had no idea who they were. Anyways. While it would be impressive, uh, impossible to identify the responsibilities that each Gyrodyne group had, because some of them are, are classified entirely, Gyrodyne group was responsible for within the space. An example of what services tech reps performed and operated for the Gyrodyne Mobile Technical Support Group, like in Yakasuka, Japan, for the Seventh Fleet, can be seen in the following example: when the inevitable casualty report or CAS reps for uh, the company was sent, would be received, indicating trouble. Here we go. Piece of shit. <clears throat> For the Western Fleet, Pacific Fleet, Westpac, the Dash Naval Air Technical Engineering Data and Service Command employees were attached to the MO27, the Mobile Ordnance Training Unit, compromise of both military and civilian technical personnel. The unit was required to provide technical assistance to ships that required help with their installed systems. Sorry, PJ. This was not easy operating from Yokosuka, Japan. Gyrodyne personnel would find themselves responding to the case rep, uh, the, casual, the casualty reports rather, case rep, by getting aboard a military aircraft, flying to Cubby Point in the Philippines, catching the carrier onboard delivery plane out to the carrier, conducting operations off Vietnam. So this is during a war, waiting until the destroyer with a problem was within range of the carrier's helicopter and then being flown down in a horse collar to, to the deck of the destroyer, lowered down by rope. I mean, I'm learning this right now with you. Uh, let's get this straight. That would be like my battery running out for my land warrior system off on a 24 hour mission or something like that. And then I look up and there's a black Hawk lowering a general dynamics employee down by a harness off a rope. And he gives me a battery and gets back up there and leaves. 
I mean, it's not that dramatic, but that's how that's what it seems like. After recovering from the inevitable seasickness, fixing the problem, and being officially detached, the GCA employee would make their way back to Yokosuka any way they could, waiting and waiting and waiting for a flight to get off the ship. Eventually, the GCA uh, Nasu employees convinced the Comradoc Sock Bok Pack back fucking acronym you were insane commander cruiser destroyer pacific fleet that to improve the system performance it was better to fix a discovered problem than wait for every destroyer in the flotilla to discover the problem itself as a result all dash systems representatives at yokosuka were transferred to the crude spac logistics representatives office at crude spac grep i'm not I'm being serious with these acronyms this is insane i can't even believe anyone even tried that that allowed for better communications as the logistics representatives had direct communication with all the destroyers and tenders to provide training as well as technical uh, assistance. Um, as seen on the right here, you see an actual service member trying to do preventative maintenance or even maintenance on it itself. Not the electronic systems, not the communication systems, not the controls, the gyrodyne leveling systems uh, and the automatic landing, but actual engine um, you know, if there's a chip in one of the rotors that ain't getting fixed, you can't fly a helicopter rear with a chip in a rotor. It doesn't fly right. Those things have to be perfectly leveled. And if you do fly it with one, you're going to rattle yourself right off course and probably crash. Um, but as I was saying, I mean, this is an evolution of how these things work. It didn't totally go away because you can see that system integrators, trainers, and maintenance people from, con from, um, from companies are still on ships everywhere, still being flown out to fix things when they need to be, still are stationed in areas where they can easily be picked up or flown, or actually just living on the ship themselves. Or, of course, every military base that's out there today has civilian contractors working on it for a levy of issues. Everything from taking out the trash to putting out fires to fixing your weapons, not all the time, uh, long-range weapons, and, of course, to uh, to train soldiers on how to use this thing. Like we, It's okay to have a person uh that's been used it before to train you but traditionally speaking they've been retired military and they take up a job for the company that they used to work alongside of like myself i didn't work for augustine very long it was a very short three months uh but i but i um you know worked along that organization for my entire military career so it was everyone i used to work with before every, you know i just became the employee rather than i was wearing i wasn't wearing a uniform anymore i was wearing a uh you know a, a tie not all the time with increased uh, with the increased tempo of operations in the area, corrosion became a major problem. The logistics representative initiated a corrosion control program with the aircraft repair facility at the uh, at Suki Naval Station. Using the aircraft using the aircraft repair facilities, the uh, this allowed the GCA representatives to identify the problems in the drone and arrange for their removal and replacement with a corrosion free aircraft. The ocean is just trying to destroy everything, folks, if you're not aware. Okay, so what happened to the dash? Where is it? Where'd it go? Why is the dash not being flown today? What's going on? Um, you know, there's, there's provocative uh, headlines being read about the dash program, about how the Navy failed the dash, but we're going to get into that in a second here. In the second half of the show, we're an hour and 18 in. I appreciate you being here. Click the links below if you want me to keep doing the show program and uh, help us keep us alive. Remember, uh, your support, this is like uh, public access here. Your support is how we keep going. I have a, a bunch of guests lined up for the future uh, for a different take on on uh, on the future of the show. And I can only really continue to do that by increasing the type of equipment I have. Even buying an SD card is, is, is too much for me to buy right now because uh, I, you know, I'm stretched out. But uh, help support the show, keep us going, click the links below. Be a friend of the show. I know a lot of you are already supporting and join the Regurgia blog. And if you haven't subscribed yet or liked the show or shared it, you're doing me a massive favor by doing so. Thank you very much. So what happened to the Dash Recon? The Dash operation ceased fleet-wide on November 30, 1970, after the U.S. government had invested $275 million on the aircraft side of that anti-submarine warfare program. Uh, although the Secretary of Defense McNamara stated in his budget report to Congress in January of 67 that the quote, last year the Dash ASW drone helicopter was encountering high, higher than expected peacetime attrition and lower than expected performance. The reason was simple. They, the continued war in Vietnam was draining production funds from all sectors of the military. To make matters worse for the Dash, the Vietnam War was not an anti-submarine warfare war. You know, 
um, the the very limited amount of naval assets that were being used by um, pro North Vietnamese countries like Russia and the Soviets were investing uh, were low, and they're investing most of their assets in SA one and two systems to knock recon vessels or aircraft out of the air, attack helicopters and things like that um, to um, you know, just the, the displaying their might and their capabilities in different ways. The SAM surface to air missiles were more effective. And so the Soviets and, uh, you know, the Indo China relations or whatever, the Sino China relations at the time were diminishing. And, uh, but the didn't, didn't change the fact that both, you know, whatever communist flavor you like, it didn't change the fact that, uh, that they were still supporting the war with other assets rather than naval assets. Uh, so, Anyways, the uh, anti-submarine war of the, the anti-submarine action of, of Vietnam basically came to a, a halt because there wasn't anyone to fight. The dash was originally designed to drop the MK-57 nuclear depth charges or torpedoes, the homing torpedoes, and it was built with the idea that it would not survive the resulting blast. So the dash could be destroyed if need be. According to dash, I'm sorry, accordingly, DASH was built with a non-redundant avionics control system using off-the-shelf components whenever possible to minimize costs, which was not a crazy thing at the time. Um, we see that, we've seen that throughout the entire history of the military. You can even get to stories like Roswell, the alleged Roswell crash, and like, oh, why would the military or our intelligence organizations use scotch tape? What do you think they're going to invent tape to use to make? Okay, anyways, all right. The initial DASH electronic control system also contributed to problems. The, uh, the complexity of the GFE system and the multitude of components and failed prone wiring harness and cannon plugs coupled with, uh, to simple, the simple FM, uh, coupled with a simple FM radio control system made maintenance a major chore for shipboard personnel. The complexity of the airborne systems um, can be illustrated by the following. Here is a over-the-shoulder image of an operator, of a service member, rather, flying uh, the dash. Actually, can you do me a massive favor, you jerk and work? When the deck control officer, seen right here, used the deck control transmitter to launch a drone, he maneuvered the drone using stick controls of, of the cyclic roll, as I showed you before, pitch and flat turn, and knob control for altitude and heading. Digital signals were then sent. Digital signals were then sent. Uh, thank you, asshole who's watching the show who won't fucking stop plaguing my phone. Um, the digital signals were then sent. Uh, were then sent from control transmitters to relay assembly for assignment to an audio frequency coder. Um, digital audio command signals were then transmitted by UHF line of sight data link. The drone transistor uh, transistorized FM radio receiver eliminated the carrier frequency and applied the audio frequency to the drone's decoder. The decoder extracted the digital messages, decoded the command information, and provided analog voltages, as well as an on and off switch disclose uh, closures for torpedo arming and release mechanics. The analog voltages were combined with sensor inputs for roll, pitch, and displacement gyros and the altitude control, and then fed to an electronic control amplifier, ECA. The ECA in turn controlled the pitch, roll, yaw, and collective servo clutches in the drone's electromechanical actuator. All these systems, both ship-based and airborne based were non-redundant, and if one single command system component failed, the drone would be lost. This can uh, this can seen in the future following. This can be seen as, uh, according to the General Accounting Office. GAO dash losses were due to 80 percent of all losses of the QH50 vehicle were due to either ship based or airborne electronic system failures. Um, 10 percent were due to controller pilot error. Five percent were due to enemy action over Vietnam, and five percent were due to airframe engine failure. I appreciate that, Dorothy. Thank you for sharing the show, everyone, whoever's helped out here. And uh, uh, you know who I appreciate you constantly plaguing my phone and computer with bots. Thank you very much. Um, the QH50C dash goes to war. Uh, let's get into that real quick right now. We're almost through the story, folks. There's a lot. I know you're taking on a lot here, but I'm trying to give you everything right from Gyrodyne themselves because, you know, I usually like to stop and uh, go on and on and on about what's going on, what's happening out there. 
While the Secretary of Defense, McNamara, was downplaying the reliability of the QH-50 to Congress in January 1967, he left out the fact that he had authorized the Navy to expand the QH-50's mission outside of its Dash ASW role to that of flying surveillance mission into Vietnam. I mean, we see this, and you might ask yourself, well, if they don't plan on dropping nuclear charges and they don't plan on attacking submarines because there's no submarines to attack, why didn't it take on a more official role? Beginning in 1965, um, to answer that question, it's, uh, it's you know, we don't know the exact timeline of things all the time. It's certainly in the minds of the people that are involved with things. Now, I don't know jack shit about how the CIA operates. Who the hell am I? All I can know is from what I've read through history and the people I've spoken to from former case officers and things like that. And, and you know, uh, station chiefs who have wrote books about or written books about their experiences places. That That's what I that's the extent of what I know. The context of what I know is from uh, the content I know is from the people that are speaking in a specific context. Um, and, you know, and I, you know, it's, it's, you can apply that and, and say, well, maybe that's why they're doing these things. Or maybe we don't know about it because of whatever. But my guess is that the dash system itself was already being eyed or eyeballed to, to take on some of these roles in places um, where, or attempts where, you know, they didn't want a recovery team. If you know about Ryan aeronautical and the evolution of the fire bee and all the other awesome cool, stealthier, and um, and capable electronic systems that, you know, signal intelligence and ELIN intelligence and photographic intelligence, They um, the, there was always a demand for other types of aircraft. Ryan, as we're pretty familiar with, because we play their their uh, videos on the show and talk about them constantly, um, you know, was fixed wing. They, that's what they specialized in, the fixed wing drones. But we have to assume that with signature reduction, it's quite possible that things like the dash were going to be implemented in the war or up you know future wars the qh50 chuck d dash goes to war and i'll say it again well while the secretary of defense mcnamara was downplaying the reliability of the qh50 to congress in january 67 he left out the fact that he had authorized the navy to expand the qh50's mission of its dash asw role to that of a flying surveillance mission in vietnam let me say that again for all those that don't understand how this works sometimes because they believe that skunk works and the way they operate is somehow unique. But in fact, that has always been the way. I'll say it a million times and a million times again. You just have up two books. One budget says you've spent all the money and you can show reasons why it's not valuable anymore. The other shows that you still have something in operation. That you just move them budget from one, uh, money from one budget to another. And it makes it look very different. <clears throat> and I'm pretty sure I've seen that firsthand now with certain programs in the military. Beginning in January 1965, acting upon the uh, uh, e, the inventing, inventiness, inventiveness, sorry, of the executive officer Phil King aboard the destroyer USS Blue DD-744, the Navy started flying reconnaissance Snoopy missions for selective destroyers. This involved the modification of the QH-50 system by the installation of a real-time video in film camera for reconnaissance and surveillance. Real time in Vietnam was something that most people don't realize was going on because they know about recovery of capsules and things like that from aircraft that had to land like the U-2 or the Canberra before or the eventually, you know, articles that went on or the Oxcart system or even Ryan Aeronautical drones that would crash into rice paddies or land in Japan or drop capsules out of the air. Or, or literally just they themselves would pull a parachute in a, <clears throat> and an aircraft would go by and scoop it up. <clears throat> this involved the modification of the QH-50 system with a real-time video. That is a big deal. Real-time video in 65 on a drone. Again, that was almost as badass, in my opinion, as being a drone being able to deploy nuclear weapons. Um, do, 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 do. This is the film canister you see right there. That is not an exhaust on the side of an engine. That's actually a film reel. The telemetry system so remote pilots could monitor their actions upon the aircraft and transponder for radar tracking of the drone. These I could see how this might cause a problem with other pilots communicating and stuff like that with other systems. I wonder. These modifications allowed for the real-time intelligence gathering for gun spotting of critical targets, such as bridges and resupply by ships and barges. 
For waiting offshore warships, uh, that's a big deal to receive real-time intelligence. The typical range of the dash launching from a destroyer five-inch guns was uh, nine nautical miles, whose projectile had fragmentation bursts, kill zones of 75 yards, which is scary, with a firing rate of four to six rounds every few minutes. Snoopy loitering time, average of one hour, resulted in a saturation level of target areas to a point where resistance was eliminated. As in, imagine a forward observer, a scout, or, you know, imagine me, not literally, I've never done this. Uh, of course, we've called in weapon systems before. But imagine me crawling through the jungle, and I've got binoculars up, and I'm like, fire, and they shoot, and I'm like, holy shit, adjust fire by miles, dipshits, you've missed the target. Okay, now you've been affected. Fire in the same position again. And then, you know, the dash provided that capability. They didn't need a special operations team. They didn't need, uh, you know, a LURS team or, or uh, you know, uh, men with painted faces to do uh, to do things uh, that, that weren't available at the time because there's no drones. By the way, this is one badass book. If you haven't read it yet, um, I'm still working on it. By um, uh, Gary A. Linderer. Black Berets and Painted Faces. Uh, you should take a look at that book if you're interested. It is crazy. Um, mostly uh, written from his uh, letters to his wife. He turned those letters into the, what was going, you know, story of what was happening. Great way to keep a memory of things. It's been a long time. Anyways, moving on. We got to finish this up here. We're, we're almost done. So now that they could see the targets being destroyed and understanding truly that uh, no one escaped the zone, and, uh, and, the, and the bridge didn't survive either. They didn't have to worry about sending a team to confirm that. They could see it with the drone. According to the gunner's mate, GM-1 of the USS General K. McKenzie, DD-836, they set a record when they fired 151 rounds in five minutes from their 5x38 caliber guns, but then had to cool the barrels off with their fire hose. This was in preparation for a Marine landing on a small peninsula not far from Da Nang. The Marine spotter in his small Piper aircraft called off, called the landing off. He said there was not a tree left standing and nothing left to hide the enemy. Each round had a 55-pound projectile load set with a proximity fuse to don't, uh, detonate just before the shell hit the ground. Point detonation high capacity, as they call it, DPHC. Each projectile was filled with shrapnel as well as high explosive rounds or high explosive uh, ordnance inside. Further, the barrel um, of these guns, I'll show you what these guns look like here. I don't want you to not know what they look like, Recon. Come on now. Why aren't you opening? There's what the guns look like uh, on the outside. And here is what they look like in a diagram, though you can't see the font very well, but you can see how they're set up. Let's go back to how they look on the outside. These weapons firing have completely obliterated the area. Um, further, the barrel of the gun did wear out with this type of use using basic rounds. Uh, uh, but as muzzle velocity increased, a drop of about 800 rounds were to be expected in the tube life. Replacing these gun barrels on the Fram destroyer was not an easy thing. The method involved a special wrench with which attempted uh, which attached at the base of the barrel in the 20 pound sledgehammer the barrel unscrewed disassembling uh, disassembled from the turret and the barrel weighed about 18 tons some a barrel weighed 18 tons holy shit 18 tons this was the process for the forward mounts um for the aft five-inch mount uh, at the fantail, Mount 53, it was completely taken off the ship and taken uh, to the overall shop. A month later, it was brought back and it was like brand new. So the the role in this, uh, or I guess the uh, QH-50 Charlie and, and Delta versions flew in a hostile environment where no manned aircraft dared to fly. You know, an uncontrolled airspace where they had SAMs and rockets and weapons that would fire and just eat the eat up the Hueys and other helicopters and the uh, light-wing aircraft that were flying around. Success using success using losses of QH-50s in Vietnam were not accurately known, but by June 1, 1970, the Navy did state that the original 746 QH-50 Charlie and Delta drone helicopters originally built for Dash uh, 411 aircraft had been lost. By late 1969, Dash be began to be removed from the Fram destroyer as well as they returned to their home ports for overhaul work. 
uh, on the destroyer. USS uh, Chevalier DD-805, for example, the dash hangar was converted into a nifty-looking cruise lounge with fake wood paneling and suspended ceiling covering the overhead fluorescent lights. Obviously, that wasn't going to last. You know, the dash took up a lot of space, and they didn't like that. But either way, the only problem with this installation was that it was installed with pop rivets. The first time Chevalier fired its five-inch guns, the entire hangar lounge was destroyed when the ceiling crashed down and most of the paneling fell off. The dash hangar was later used to simple, simply store all the stuff the crew bought overseas. Um, after Dash, Snoopy, and Vietnam, the QH-50 continued. Now, although the Snoopy reconnaissance flights over Vietnam ceased in 1970, Um, in um, 1970, continued testing with APRA, you know, DARPA, early DARPA, but ARPA in, uh, APRA, uh, ARPA in conjunction with the U.S. Army allowed for all their follow-up programs using the unique coaxial unmanned QH-50 Delta helicopter, such as the Night Reconnaissance Night Panther, seen below, which is pretty slick here. I've seen right here, I then I've seen below, Jesus. Um, take a look at this bad, Larry. Nope. Why isn't it showing up? There we go. The Night Panther. Um, uh, in covert target acquisition called Blow Low. Around this time, other the other remaining QH-50 aircraft uh, were transferred to the Naval Air Station in China Lake and the U.S. Army at White Sands Missile Range for use as target drones. There, there the aircraft were used um, to test and improve the next generation of anti-aircraft missiles, air defense systems, and so on. The Army used the QH-50 extensively in Stinger, Avenger, and FADS um, development. And uh, Sergeant York there, T and E. During the base realignment of 1996, uh, NAS China Lake transferred all remaining Navy QH-50 aircraft to the ongoing U.S. Army White Sands Missile Range at, uh, for QH-50 operations. China Lake. No, uh, today, the QH-50 Charlie and Delta continues to fly every day on the no-kill missions. This is uh, written, obviously, some, year, some, uh, some years ago, but um, technically speaking, they still have some in flying and they're not being used directly. This means that the aircraft is not intentionally being shot down. Instead, the aircraft acts as a target radar IR emulator, testing missile guidance and ground attack uh, equipment capabilities so the future American fighting force receive the best equipment in the field possible. Now, where have we heard this before? You know, a lot of people think that when you fly a, uh, you know, a a drone around out there in the field, that it's the drone themselves that they're, uh, you know, they care about. But you know, you can program the electric signature and uh, the radar turn and cross section and and um, you know, the, basically everything about the signature of a known enemy aircraft and a program it to a drone so that the drone looks just like, at the time, MiGs. Or the drone in the current day would look just like some SU whatever fighter over there or whatever new stealth thing they've got. And in doing so, things like Project Palladium were invented. We've talked about it a million times, exaggerating with the numbers, but it's, it represents a moment in history where we no longer even needed the drone. You could simply have aircraft go out there and get in dogfights with nothing more than the air because their radar and every every other radar and every other tracking system they had, early warning systems were saying that there's an aircraft right in front of them and there's nothing there at all. The QH-50D at White Sands operated by the U.S. Army's Program Executive Office uh, Simulation Training and Instrumentation Programs known as PEO, STRI, Simulation Training and Instrumentation Command. Um, the QH-50, uh, after 42 years, after, and this is written, obviously not right now. When the hell, what's this article come out? I'm sorry. Yitsky. I don't even know when this article was released, but it was, I, I believe 2002 or 2013. This is what article was released. Um, that's pretty impressive. The QH-50 after 42 years is still going strong. Overseas, the Japanese dash uh, was a little different, but not much.
Yeah, we're going to wrap this up in a second here, folks. I know we're, we're, we're quite long here. Project Angry Kitten that causes ghost plans. Yeah, that's Angry Kitten, Palladium, and now we're seeing the same ability with Nemesis and things like that. Um, <clears throat> while the U.S. Navy's DASH program was in full operation, the Navy loaned Japan Ma uh, Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force, JMSDF, a single three, or, or rather three Q... H-50 Chucks drones under the military assistance program MAP and sold the, sold the JMSDF, a single D model aircraft in 1965 to see if DASH could bolster their um, capabilities. The C model aerial numbers, a uh, serial number rather of these were the DS-1278 and 1279 and 1280. The D model was the, was the DS-1494. The dual torpe uh, torpedo delivery capability in any weather, a 45 mile delivery range and approximately um, close proximity to the Soviet Union naval, naval base, the Japanese were very interested in the DASH concept for obvious reasons. There are stories that go back uh, to you know post-World War II where the Russian Navy and, um, and air capabilities were taking on any aircraft that even was in Japanese air. I mean, they just assumed if you're flying a Canberry Electric uh, uh, near us or a U-2 or eventually the Oxcar program in the SR-71, uh, eventually it was shoot missiles at this goddamn thing because they're only here for one reason, even if they're in Japanese air. The Japanese didn't like that, and they also felt threatened, so they wanted a weapon system or a surveillance system, a nuclear delivery system that was capable of doing so, even though, of course, we know that they're, uh, they were not nuclear capable at the time. After testing, uh, the Japanese um, um, organization purchased 16 additional aircraft from Gyrodyne in 1967, all D models through the Niso I Iowa, Nisho Iowa Trading Company with the final delivery of September 1971. They were uh, serial numbers J1 through J16. Those are the 15. Right, uh, you know, the QH, the this guy right here, the... QH-50 Chuck, number DS-1279, flies for the first time on November 5th, 1966, from training base at Etnajima, Japan. Etnajima, Japan. The J JMSDF training facility. By early 1970, seven Japanese destroyers were flying with the Dash, with a success rate of 500 hours of flight time. Um, these destroyers consisted of four Moon and Zuki class and three cloud class and gumo class um, ships. The construction, I don't have pictures of those, sorry. The construction sequence of the first six or seven were, um, I'm going to pronounce these names wrong and I apologize. Taka, Takatsuki, Kikazuki, Moshizuki, Nakatsuki, Minagumi, Natsagumo, and Marakumo. Nailed it, I'm sure. Jesus, I'm sorry. Due to the fact that JMSDF was a defense force, their deployments on ships were short, thus decreasing costs associated with expensive support equipment. Perhaps due to this economic decision, several QH-50s were uh, achieving a phenomenal success rate. Um, and one might think, oh, I wonder what would happen if McNamara um, had uh, endorsed uh, a, a, a you know, more accurate use of the things or streamlined approach for him. Let's wrap this up. Although a success uh, in Japan, concerns over Gyrodyne's continued viability in the face of the U.S. Navy's DASH program cancellation caused the Japanese DASH program to cease um, just some time later in 1977. At the time, the Japanese had lost only three reported aircraft. Uh, what happened to the other remaining J uh, QH-50s is completely unknown, even by the Gyrodyne company. As seen left, the uh, our scene of the pic... Oh, I didn't switch, sorry. As seen in the picture here, um, four QH-50 Deltas and two QH-50 aircraft were shown in line at a Japanese training site in uh, Etajima, and so uh, um, which were also uh, the site of the JSMFD of Naval Academy in June 1970. And finally, we'll get we get ready to end this thing here. I appreciate everyone being here. I appreciate your time. Appreciate everyone spending time with me, including you uh, sending me the bots to attack my computer on a daily basis and make my phone ring nonstop all day. And all the lovely emails. Thank you. Um, today, surprisingly, the Gyronon Helicopter Company continued to operate beyond the date 
that the last QH50 AD model or SND175 uh, helicopters rolled off the production line um, today being 20 years ago, uh, 25 years ago. Um, on August 29th, 1969, um, <laughs> Pete Eccles with Dog and his final assembly crew seen left with the last QH50 Delta was built. And uh, that's this crew here. Uh, there's the doggo. Arf, arf. You can see the size of this thing in comparison to people standing upright. I mean, even with the uh, less deck space taken up than a regular helicopter, but obviously the amount needed by all the other stuff, you see that the, these things were significantly smaller than than uh, many other aircraft out there. In a big old open ocean, um, unless you have this thing perfectly lined up on your in your sights or uh, on radar somewhere, it was just a speck, which is rather remarkable. Um, from October 1999 to March 2004, the Gyrodyne Company um, uh, tested an article AE model. Um, and whenever I see the word article on anything, I tend to think it, it's, uh, it's other intelligence organizations that are working on this uh, rather than like a larger contract with the military, as you know, article was uh, used constantly in reference to um, to uh, older, you know, X-plane, like, oh, not X-planes, but things that would eventually make it to the X-plane world. Um, this is the Gyrodyne. Um, so from 99 to March 2004, the Gyrodyne CA company it, uh, and the article AE model, which is on the side here, uh, um, continue to sell parts and, and provide technical service to existing users of the QH-50 Chuck and Delta and assist a German-based license that was considered manufacturing, a, uh, that considered manufacturing moder modified QH-50 for NATO use. The Gyrodyne also... Um, can continue to improve upon their existing QH-50s in the hope that the Department of Defense would again find a uh, better tactical use for their unmanned aircraft uh, that served in both the Cold War and the Vietnam Cold War and Vietnam Wars. I mean, technically, we're covering the same thing here. Um, Gyrodyne boasts that not a single American life was lost in operation of their aircraft, but it was not. You know, that's what they were designed to be. With the war on terrorism in Afghanistan and the second Iraq war, the Department of Defense did not support the only vendor of the uh, the only deployed VTOL UAV system in the world. Uh, and any Gyrodyne, and anyway, Gyrodyne was forced to close their doors. Many key assets were donated to the Gyrodyne Foundation for preservation and museum placement. And uh, th these systems, uh, you know, represented a, a wake in um, in a proliferation in an advent, I guess, of, of something that really has never stopped of course we've looked at drones all the way back to the early 1900s and the evolution of them but one thing is for sure in our ever uh evolving story of vtol aircraft this holds a place way up at the top because not only is it something that we have plenty of evidence for it actually existing and being operated and used but it um it was a significant um you know capability that our adversaries simply didn't have in a major way uh, and even though like people like the Nazis were working on radio controlled telemetry and things like that for bombs and other aircraft and even drone boats, suicidal, like, you know, kamikaze drone boats, um, you know, it was remarkably advanced for the time. And when, encry and when encryption came along, these things could then fly in the area of other pilots. The, the Gyrodyne system, uh, the QH-50 Chucks and Deltas, um, like I said a minute ago, would probably make pilots nervous for many reasons, but they also... Uh, were reported to have interfered with um, other systems in use. If you're going to use the QH-50 Chuck off your boat and scouting a uh, target on land in Vietnam, um, you have to make sure there's not a C-130 out there controlling, uh, um, you know, Ryan aeronautical drones with the CIA. And when they start to interfere with each other, um, you know, and cause losses or cause dismay, if you will, uh, there, there, there is worry there, but you know, with uh, with you know, with the knowledge that the Chinese had figured out a way to drop our aircraft out of the sky, not just with kinetic and you know, with with explosives, but with you know, taking over of open-ended radio frequencies. Even though there was encryption between the drone and the operator, 
um, or the drone in the in the deployment system, there was not encrypted communications between the drones and the aircraft that were flying around in the air, high altitude. So there was interference. There was recognition that we could take these things on, and you saw that happen all the way to you know to today. We see I you know not that long ago, Iran was knocking some of our most sophisticated drones out of the sky and saying, "Never, hey, everyone, look what we got." It's still happening. Uh, but the uh, this thing did make quick improvements, and it laid the the the, the, the pathway for so many systems to come. It's also weird as fuck looking, is it not? It's just weird looking. It looks strange. And for many reasons, I would have to assume that people who had never seen a helicopter before were sure as hell never seen a helicopter drone that looks like these things. So this is the story of the <laughs> of the drone anti-submarine submarine helicopter. And if you have uh, any information you want to supply, to update the story other, other than the information I just read off this website and other uh, in a little script I put together, please submit it because uh, I would love to get deeper into these things, especially if you know about missions they flew on or maybe your parent or something flew one and uh, or maybe you flew one yourself. I know that the average age and viewer of the show is over 50 years old. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, cats and kittens, please click the link below. This show is completely supported by you people over on the Regurgia blog. You can go sign up on Patreon. There's a link down there for it. Or you can submit through Zelly, Cash App, uh, PayPal, YouTube Super Chats, anything. This is a free operation. And just like a public access program, once in a while, we need your support. And this is no different. Uh, this costs money to put out the show, and I appreciate you spending time with us. And so I'd help you show some appreciation back this way. Thank you very much, Recon. Take it easy. Look for uh, an episode in the future. We've got future guests coming on. We're going to be tackling um, some unconventional warfare stories. As you know, we talk about some jaw-dropping military endeavors. And so we're going to be talking about, um, you know, I personally think this is what we're going to be talking about. I don't even know yet because I haven't conducted the interview yet. But um, I believe we'll be chatting about, uh, you know, the decision to take Saddam out of power, the technology that was used on the field at the time, the operations that can be discussed that have been declassified in order to run that thing, and just a little insight, I believe, into how, you know, certain things are happening in, uh, in a very, uh, you know, the black world, if you will. Uh, and I, I, that's not a real word I would use, but... Um, if you know anything about the history of like ground branch stuff, and I won't go any further into that because I'm not trying to piss anyone off, but uh, you know that there's there's some pretty interesting routes in, of military careers and ways that people get involved and whatnot, how they're selected. And all that is kind of not known in, you know, not because it's classified in any way, not all of it, but because there's not many people that are writing stories about it. And I just happen to run into someone who I believe has an interesting story. I don't know if any of that's even related to this person. It's going to be a pretty interesting experience. Do me a massive favor, Recon. Stay tuned. Hit that subscribe, the like, and uh, share the show when possible. Remember, uh, be nice to one another. Uh, try to do something good for your neighbor today. I don't, you're not your literal neighbor, but, um, you know, and also mental health is part of regular health. So please go get yourself checked out if you feel like you're suffering from mental health. I know a lot of people out there uh, just believe that the brain isn't even part of the body because their insurance companies say so. But uh, we're all a little tweaked up there. And, uh, you know, let's be forgiving and understanding when we when we can. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, cats and kittens, pooches and pound puppies, keep it weird and keep your third eye peeled. And remember, Recon, home is where you make it. You like to see homos naked? And I quote once again from Genesis. Well, we're waiting. Been on a lot of shows, but there's no better crowd than just right here. Ladies and gentlemen, would you give a big Metroplex welcome to the most famous entertainer ever to wear a cowboy hat? This is Whiplash, the Cowboy Monkey. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. I still think you came out here just to cover your ass. <laughs> Don't make it sound like a fucking fat, plumpy, delicious cock. <laughs> Why are you gay? He says I'm gay. You are gay. Recon, my friend said the other day, the only reason why Democrats want to help drug addict homeless people is to get their votes. If you ever see a Democrat going to help 
a poor person, it's because they want them to get up and go vote for them. I mean, these people aren't getting up to go to the bathroom. <laughs>